Hi, this is Mark Galliotti, now Senior Associate Researcher at the Royal United Services Institute and also an honorary professor at UCL CIS, with another very personal quick take on Russian developments. And this time in the news, it's once again a speech by everyone's favourite bugbear, the Russian Chief of the General Staff, General Gerasimov. Um, his big outlining what Russian military strategic research ought to be, annual speech, uh, which, needless to say, those who are desperate to bespy the presence of some kind of Gerasimov doctrine, new way of war, have leapt on us saying, aha, we have been vindicated. Well, spoiler alert, in my opinion, they haven't. Let me just go through it very briefly. Uh, this is based, by the way, on the full text of the speech, which we just had produced today in Krasnaya Zvezda, the Army's newspaper's uh, website, um, rather than just simply the excerpts which we had from TASS before. Anyway, this is a speech he has to give every year, and in some ways feels sorry for the poor guy, because he basically has to say the same things every year, because, frankly, the nature of strategic thinking has not changed, and he has to find different ways of, of, of saying it. So there's always an element of what one could call rhetoric creep. Maybe he sort of says things a little bit more forcefully, but on the whole I'd say not. More to the point, this is six years after the initial one that people sort of used to d describe this notion of some sort of grand Russian strategy. Um, six years in which things have changed, in particular Syria and Venezuela. Syria is an example of what they would regard as highly effective uh, power projection, which involve military and what they call information operations, information warfare. But remember, they use information warfare in a much, much broader sense than ours. We might use it really to talk about strategic communications, propaganda, that kind of thing. Whereas for them, it's actually all forms of information-related activity, so also radio-technical te stuff. More to the point, Venezuela is an interesting case, because actually, from the Russians' point of view, a moderately paranoid point of view, admittedly, um, the use most recently of aid as, in effect, a, a kind of weaponized instrument of political war, um, actually just simply proves what they've been saying all along. And remember, the whole essence of what Gerasimov has been saying is not, aha, this is our new secret strategy for destabilizing the West. It's actually a, look, we believe the West fights its wars these, this way, and this is how we are preparing to resist it. Because, after all, Gerasimov is a political advocate who needs to convince the Kremlin that the military is on top of the things that are scaring the snot out of them. So... It's essentially the same speech, but on the other hand, in, in an era where it actually seems to be that the sort of tensions are, are, are getting tighter, but also that in fact the West is once again being aggressive in its use of Gibridnaya Voina, hybrid war, as uh, he's calling it now, a sort of Trojan horse style of warfare. But beyond that, there's a particular passage that actually I, I, I found most striking, so I don't have it committed to memory. What he says, and this is from my own rough translation, still, the main content of military strategy is preparation for war and its conduct, primarily by the armed forces. In other words, he's stressing that actually their job is still the traditional shooting things. Yes, we take into account all other non-military measures that affect the course and outcome of war and provide and create the conditions for the effective use of military force. At the same time, it should be understood that confrontation in other domains represents separate areas of activity with their own strategies, modalities, and corresponding resources. Let me just unpack some of the elements there. First of all, he's saying, look, as I say, basically the core element we're looking at is war, and understood in a sort of war fighting, tanks, guns, planes, and bombs sense. Secondly, though, he said, yes, of course, we, we have to consider all these non-military means. Well, of course they do, everyone does. The US military, the British military, every serious military looks at non-military means of, in effect, preparing the battlefield and improving their warfighting op opportunities. Whether it's undermining the morale of the other side or whatever, it doesn't matter. This, this is not something that is somehow special. This is somehow something that everyone is doing. But most interesting in that last bit where he says, well, yeah, you know, there are other domains, but that is, in effect, other people's business. I mean, he then goes on to actually make a case that the general staff should have a role in, in his words, coordinating but not directing these other means. So again, he's once again really stressing the point that there, there, there are separate realms of contention, which are not primarily the military's responsibility, but obviously in which the military feels it, it has, has a stake. Now again, why is that important? Well, first of all, 
I mean, obviously, these, these things everyone just simply reads to try and prove their own prejudices and assumptions. With the, there's the whole, you know, people who jump on it as proof of Gerasimov doctrine. Well, from my point of view, I'm going to do exactly the same. And for me, this, this demonstrates that there is this two-strand approach to Russian thinking that I've been banging on about, and indeed I'll mention is covered in my most recent book, Russian Political War. There is the militarist perspective, which is how you use these non-military means precisely to enhance your war-fighting capabilities. And then there is the perspective that is adopted by the national security establishment, particularly within the presidential administration and the Security Council, which is that in circ there are certain circumstances, and particularly dealing with NATO, in which you cannot really envisage a military conflict, and we would not want to. However, through these various non-military means, we may be able to accomplish the same. It is aggressive, it is manipulative, it is confrontational, but it is ultimately not leading to, to shooting. And this is, I think, something that Gerasimov is, is implicitly recognising, that there is this division. And he's taking a claim for the fact that the general staff ought to be more directly involved in the discussions, the debates, the strategising about that. Now, you do that because you're not in the room at the moment. And again, I think this is interesting, because implicitly he's acknowledging that, in fact, the military is not a tremendously powerful institution in those terms. That there are other people making decisions, and yes, we're talking presidential administration, we're talking the intelligence community and so forth, about a whole area of strategy in which the military is really largely relegated to just playing a sort of a secondary role. And, again, as the advocate, he's pushing to say, no, no, no we, we, we need to be in the room. A room that at the moment is closed to us. So that, that's my quick take. Um, as I sort of read the text in, in, in more detail, future points, if I have time, and if I think there's anything interesting to say, I will probably write a, a blog post or an article about that. But for the moment, key takeaways, no, there's no Gerasimov doctrine. Of course, they talk about information operations, but so does it every military. But thirdly, that there is a separate realm, a separate series of domains of direct activity, confrontation, war, whatever you want to call it, that do not involve shooting and are not really currently ones in which the military has much traction and he's not happy about that. Well, that's me. Thank you very much indeed.